So imagine that you and I work together, and we're just about to start a new project that uses computer vision. The only problem is we've never worked with computer vision before, and so to get a bit of practice, we're going to work on a simple computer vision project together. So what's the project we're going to work on? Well, we want to perform object detection on surfers. So for example, given this video of surfers, we'd like the application to draw bounding boxes over each surfer in the water. So how challenging is it to do something like this? Well, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it is pretty easy with the modern tools that are available to us. So what are the tools we'll be using? Well, primarily two tools, OpenCV, which is an open source computer vision library, and YOLO version 8, which is a cutting edge state of the art library for classification, object detection, segmentation, and so on. Okay, let's get started. The first thing we'll do is create a project directory named surfer vision, and inside that directory, I'll create a virtual environment by keying in Python, and I'll add the M switch for module, followed by venv, and I'll name the directory venv as well. Next, I'll activate the virtual environment by keying in source venv slash bin slash activate. Now there's only one package that we need to install, which is the Ultralytics package. This package includes YOLO version 8, and it will install OpenCV as a dependency, which we'll use as well. So to install our dependency, I'll key in pip install Ultralytics. Now I'll open up this directory in Visual Studio Code, and I'll create a main.py file. All right, I've got this video named surfers that I'll put in this directory, and this is the video I'd like to perform object detection on. So to start, let's programmatically read frames from this video one by one. To do this, I'll first import CV2, which is the OpenCV library that was installed along with Ultralytics. Next, we'll load the video by creating a capture object. To do this, I'll say capture equals cv2.videocapture, and I'll pass in the video file name. Now, to read an individual frame from the video, I'll call capture.read, and of course I'll store what's returned from this method, which is a two-element tuple, in a isFrame and a frame variable. Next, I'll show the frame on our screen by keying cv2.imshow, then I'll pass in a name for the window, which I'll call video, and then I'll pass in the frame. Okay, we can run our script as it is, which I'll do, but you'll notice that it immediately ends and we don't really see anything. Now, in reality, the script we just wrote showed the frame momentarily, but then it immediately closed, which isn't very useful. So to pause execution after showing the frame, I'll key in cv2.waitkey, and I'll pass in a zero. Okay, so this line will effectively block execution until a key is pressed on the keyboard, which gives us a chance to look at the frame on the screen. Next, I'll do a little bit of cleanup at the end of the script by calling capture release, and lastly calling cv2.destroyallwindows. Okay, let's run our script, and as you can see here, we're seeing the first frame of our video. Cool. All right, so we can read the first frame of the video, but how do we get to other frames in the video? Well, we just need to put this bit of code here in a while loop. So to do this, I'll say while true, then I'll indent these three lines of code. Let's run the script again. Okay, so we're still only seeing the first frame, but if I press a key on the keyboard, you'll notice that we see the next frame, and the next frame, and so on. All right, so how do we get the video to play continuously? Well, we can just change the argument to wait key from zero to one, which means wait for one millisecond for a key press before continuing. Now I'll run our script again, and as you can see, the video is playing, and it's playing pretty fast. So there's a problem with our script, which is that there's no way to stop the video. It just keeps playing until it's done, and then we see an error in the terminal. All right, to fix this, I'm gonna store the value returned by the wait key function, which by the way, is the key code for the key that's pressed on the keyboard. Then I'll say, if the key is the number 27, which is the code for the escape key, then break out of this loop. Okay, let's give this a try, and now we see the video playing, and if I press escape, the video stops playing. Cool. All right, there's still one bug in our script, which you can see if I play the video to completion. So the problem is, when we get to the end of the video, there are no more frames to show, but we're still trying to show one on this line right here, which leads to an error. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, we have this isFrame variable right here, which we can use to see if the returned frame is a valid frame. So to properly handle this scenario, I'll say if not isFrame, then I'll break out of the loop. Okay, so we're able to read each frame of the video, and we're displaying it on the screen, which is great. Now let's add in object detection. So to handle object detection, we'll use YOLO in our script. So I'll say from Ultralytics, import YOLO. Next, I'll create the YOLO object by setting model equal to YOLO, and we need to pass in the model we wish to use in YOLO. Okay, so what do we put here? 
Well, if you look at Yolo's README file, you see a few different models you can use. So will these models work for us? In other words, will one of these models be able to detect surfers? Well, it might work because the default models can detect 80 different classes of objects, and two of the objects it can detect are relevant to our project. So what are the two objects I'm talking about? Well, the default model can detect people and surfboards. So let's try the small size model to start. So to use the model, I'll pass in the string yoloV8s for small dot pt. Now, you might be wondering, where is this model file we intend on using? Well, the way this works is, if the file exists locally in this project directory, then it will use the local model file, but if it doesn't exist, it will go ahead and download it from the repo's assets and then use it. The next thing we'll do is perform object detection by calling model and passing in our frame, then I'll save what's returned by this function in a results variable. Now, just below this, I'll print out the results, and also for the moment, I'll change this one back to a zero so that we can more easily inspect what's printed to the console. So I'll run our script again, but this time things are taking a bit longer because we're performing object detection. Okay, now it's downloading the model file, which is to be expected, and now we see the first frame. All right, let's go take a closer look at the console. Okay, so we see the model detected four people and it took about 64 milliseconds to complete, which is a little bit slow, but we'll come back to this in a moment. You see this boxes attribute? This holds the coordinates of the bounding boxes for the four people that were detected. I want to access these bounding box coordinates so that we can draw some boxes onto the frames. So how do we get the bounding boxes? Well, first, I want to point out that our results object, which we see printed in the console, is actually a list. So let's do the following. We'll say for result in results, then in the loop, to get the bounding boxes, I'll create a variable named bboxes, and I'll set it to result.boxes.xyxy, and then I'll print the boxes, and I'll run our script again. Okay, so now we see this list of lists here, and each one of these lists represents the xy coordinates for the bounding box, and we can use these to draw boxes on the image frames. We'll need to do a couple of other things first though. We need to convert this tensor array to a numpy array, and we need to convert the floating point numbers to integers. So to handle this, I'll do the following. I'll call the CPU function, followed by a call to numpy, and then a call to the function as type, and I'll pass in the string int. Okay, let's run our script again, and now we see the numpy array of integers. Cool. All right, now let's draw these boxes on our image frames. So to do this, I'll say for bbox in bboxes, then I'll destructure the x and y coordinates from the bounding box by keying x comma y comma x2 comma y2 equals bbox. Now I'll draw the rectangle by keying cv2.rectangle, which will draw on the frame, and I'll pass in the top left point, followed by the bottom right point, and I'll pass in a green color and a line thickness of two. Okay, I'll run our script again, and check that out. We've got bounding boxes around the people it detected. Cool. Now, it didn't detect all the surfers, but we'll circle back to this in a moment. Let's change the wait key parameter back to one so the video plays continuously, and we'll run the script again. Okay, so it plays, but it's pretty slow. Each inference is taking around 60 milliseconds, which gives us a frame rate of around 16 to 17 frames per second. So why is it slow? Well, the reason it's slow is because YOLO is using my CPU instead of my GPU. So the question is, can YOLO use my GPU on my M1 Mac? There's a way you can check this by using the PyTorch package. So I'll import torch, then right here where the inference happens, I'll say if torch.backends.mps.is available, then we'll pass in the device parameter, which I'll set to the string mps. Otherwise, we'll infer the result using the CPU in my case. Now, if you're not using a Mac and you've got a properly installed NVIDIA GPU, then the model should default to using the GPU. Okay, I'll run the script again and check out how fast it's working now. Inference takes about 20 milliseconds when it's using the GPU, so it's about three to four times faster. Cool. So how well is the model we're using working? Well, I'd say it's decent, but towards the end of the video, when the surfers are off in the distance, it doesn't detect most of the surfers. So what can we do to improve the accuracy of detections? Well, we could use one of the bigger models, but there's a trade-off. With the bigger models, we get improved accuracy, but slower inference. Let's try using the biggest model, so I'll change the model from yellow V8S for small to yellow V8X for extra large, and then I'll run the script again. Now we see the extra large model being downloaded. 
Okay, so inference is definitely slower. It's taking about 55 milliseconds in total time, which gets us to about 18 frames per second, but it does seem to be more accurate in detecting surfers. All right, so what if we're not satisfied with the accuracy and or the speed of inference? Well, another option would be to perform custom training on images or videos of actual surfers, which in theory could result in significantly improved accuracy with a potentially smaller and faster model. So stay tuned to the next video where you'll learn how to train a model on actual surfer images and we'll see if we can achieve better results with the custom trained model. Hey, here at Mycelial, we're building development tools for machine learning on the edge. More specifically, we're building the data backbone for edge machine learning applications. If you're curious about what we're building, I'd encourage you to join our mailing list to learn more.